Welcome, folks. It's good to see you joining a few minutes early. We're just going to hang on for about three to five minutes until we have a critical mass. Again, welcome to those who are just joining. We're glad you are with us to delve into structural racism and the history of land policy and how it's carved inequity into our communities. We're gonna wait just another minute until we're live stream, Facebook and LinkedIn. There's also closed captioning, but let's just hold a minute while others join us. Um, well, I'll send you the link. Oh, actually, um, Irina, can you send me the link for um, uh, regular participants? Yes, I will. Right. I'll email it to you. Or right. I'll the email it to me so I can forward it to my wife. She wants to, she wants to, to watch upstairs. Welcome, folks. We're so glad you're joining us for this first in a three-part webinar series. Again, it has just turned, depending on the time, it's just turned the hour somewhere Eastern time. It's 12 uh, noon Pacific. We will start in just about one minute. We want to give enough time for a critical mass of folks to join us. Hello, everyone. While we're waiting for those to join, let me do a few housekeeping things. I'll also come back to them a little later. This is being recorded. It's also live stream on Facebook and LinkedIn. In addition, it's closed caption. Recordings will be available immediately after the webinar. You will receive um, a survey with information on the next two webinars in the three-part series. Following that email will be another one and you will receive the links to the recordings. They will also be available on YouTube. More information will come. Again, recording as well as being live streamed on Facebook and LinkedIn. And given that we have nearly 100 or more than 100 individuals who have joined, let's go ahead and start. So welcome everyone. I'm Lynn Pretty, and I'm very honored to be the president of Claremont Lincoln University. We're glad you've joined us to dig into the topic of structural racism particularly from the lens of land policy, how it's happened, the reality of past practice, and what we can do to confront and change it. It's a three webinar series. It's a collaboration between Claremont Lincoln University. We're an institution focused on high impact leadership and socially conscious graduate education. And our collaborator is the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. And folks, if you don't know them, boy, you need to link into their website and find out about them. They're an extraordinary foundation that has focused the last 75 years on building sustainable communities and on confronting disparities through a land policy lens. In fact, you're in for a treat because uh, the president and CEO of the Lincoln Institute, Dr. George, we call him Mac McCarthy, is kicking off the series with this first webinar. You're going to walk away considering how 50 years of bad land policy has literally carved inequity into our communities. So Max Bio is on the event site. You also received reminder emails. I encourage you to take a look at his work. He's been with the Lincoln Institute, the Ford Foundation, and the Center for Urban and Regional Studies. He's a leader whose career has focused on tackling complex social economic and environmental issues. He's been focused on improving the quality of life in our communities and on creating opportunities for disadvantaged populations through novel solutions. Plus folks, he's a faculty member at Claremont Lincoln University and his new course on urban sustainability launches in early November. So Mac, before we jump to housekeeping again, how are you? I'm very well, thanks Lynn. And I'm really happy to join you all today. Perfect. So. 
Before we jump to Mac and begin to learn, a big shout out to three California cities that are actually taking this three webinar series further. They're testing the knowledge, they're applying it, they're creating their story maps, and they're pursuing a three course advanced practice certificate in public administration, innovations and trends at Claremont Lincoln University. They're piloting the certificate for us, it's team based. Teams from cities, workers, emerging leaders, and current leaders are actually um, customizing the certificate to take on and address the issues you're going to hear about. So now, last time at the housekeeping items, folks, before I turn it over to Mac, again, we're being recorded. You will have access to the recordings afterward. We're also live streamed on Facebook and LinkedIn. We also have closed captioning. A resource packet as well as surveys to evaluate our webinar is coming your way. Don't forget about the next two webinars in the series. We won't let you, we'll tell you all about it. And most importantly, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A. The chat is not open, but please send questions. I will interrupt Mac. The webinar is fabulous if you pepper us with questions and he can directly respond to them. We all learn more that way. So with that, Matt, we're ready to learn. Great, thanks, Lynn. And thanks everybody for joining us uh, on this uh, wonderful Wednesday. So um, uh, I wanna kind of uh, contextualize the moment, the historical moment we're in uh, and uh, help us understand both the challenges that we face going forward, but how many of the challenges we face now have been with us for close to a century. And so, um, what I also want to do is kind of uh, remind people of the importance of land policy and being able to deal with some of these vexing issues like structural inequality. Um, and in order to do that, I need you to understand what land policy is. So land policy is a pretty big, big uh, area. It, 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 it has a large scope, but in its simplest form, the way I like to describe land policy is the, the rules of the game that define the relationship between people and place. And if you think about that for a moment, what does that mean? Well, land policy reconciles the conflict between the private interests of those who own and control land and the collective interests of society more broadly. So it's a big book of rules and it, those rules range from defining what we do on land through things like land use planning and zoning or how we might exploit land through property taxes or water and mineral, mineral rights or how we might conserve land through pr public protections or private easements. But it gets played out in multiple levels, at the local level, at the, at the state level, at the national level, at the global level. And they're all important and relevant for kind of the quality of life that we all enjoy. Because if we get land policy wrong, it's really unlikely that we're gonna be able to um, have the quality of life that we all hope to have. So today I really wanna talk about how land policy especially land policy over the last hundred years, reinforced economic, social, political, and health disadvantages based on race. And it's a story that reflects, I think, two important things. Number one, how today's maps are defined by policy decisions made almost a century ago. And number two, why in spite of numerous attempts to address racial inequities, stubborn differences exist across race in every measure of quality of life. And so I'm gonna lay it out in a drama that is in three acts. And the first act is, starts with the Great Depression. And it will end with the social and political unrest that we've experienced in the last couple of years related to COVID and the um, murder of George Floyd and the social unrest that that sparked in all the cities in the US and many cities abroad. Okay, and the sub theme, and I, I want you to just reflect on this because it's not really uh, totally relevant to what I'm talking about, but it's important for all of you who are lifelong learners and social scientists because um, one of the things that has always troubled me as a longtime social scientist is that social scientists have studied and recommended remedies to poverty for centuries and noticed that it has a strong correlation with race. But the problem with the way we studied uh, inequality and poverty is that we, we study poverty as if it's a disease. And that dominant approach of this, uh, the way we study poverty as a, as a disease is to say, to understand poverty, we should study the victims. 
And then we illustrate the problem with lots of descriptive statistics. Um, and we provide all these analgesic solutions that don't address the root causes. But one of the things you'll learn if you become a student at Claremont Lincoln University, or you listen to me, is that very often problems that are rooted in systems have really nothing to do with the victims themselves or the choices they make. The systems produce the problem. And so we have to unpack our thinking about poverty and inequality if we think it's really um, the result of decisions that individuals make and understand it more as a result of systemic elements that lead to the generation of inequality as an outcome of that system. So Kate, if you'd go to the, the first uh, slide, please, thanks. So this is where we are, right? And so, and this is 2016, it hasn't gotten any better since 2016, but if we compare the um, wealth uh, across races um, from 1983 to 2016, that's over what, a 33 year period, we'll note that for everybody, you know, distressingly, uh, the wealth has actually gone down. Uh, between 1983 and 2016, from $84,000 to $81,000. That's the first couple of bars. But for whites, the wealth went up. The average wealth of whites went up from $110,000 for family to $146,000 for family. And then we compare that to the wealth of minorities, Blacks and Latinos. And for Blacks and Latinos, not only is the, is the wealth gone down for Blacks, but they've been, they were at miserably low levels to start with. So in 1983, uh, the average black family had a, a net uh, worth or wealth of $7,000 compared to $110,000 for white families. So that's a ratio of let's say 15. And today they have a net wealth of $3,500 compared to $146,000, which is like a factor of close to 50. And for Latinos, the story is not much better their net wealth in 1983 was even lower than blacks at $4,000, $4,200. But at least it's gone up. It's gone up from 1983 to 2016 to $6,500, uh, which is still um, a tiny share of the wealth of um, whites. So Mac, we have our first question and it's just, it's a commentary. Um, have Asian demographics been compared or evaluated? Yes, they have. And, and Asians, uh, they, they, they track much closer to whites than they do to Blacks and Latinos. And that has a lot to do with education levels and um, other um, socioeconomic factors. But that, that, that's, another, that's another topic for another time. So Kate, could you go to the next slide? So as it turns out, if we really want to explain uh, the wealth differences across race, we don't really have to look any further than housing. Um, and in particular, home ownership, because about 80% of the net worth of families is actually contained in housing. Um, and so, as you see, the home ownership rates uh, have once again been distressingly uh, uh, you know, stagnant from 1983 to 2016. They're about the same, just a little bit over 60%. And, and for whites, though, the home ownership rates uh, have gone up. And in 2016, Homeownership rates for whites was over 70% of white uh, families own their homes. But for blacks, uh, the, the homeownership rate is um, considerably lower at uh, right around 40%. And that hasn't changed at all from 1983 to 2016. For Latinos, it was even lower in 1983 and it's gone up, but now it's at right about the same level as the rate uh, for um, blacks. And this is uh, important, as I said, because the lion's share of wealth uh, but for American families is held in their homes. So Mac, right. a question that you may want to link through later, but just to have in the back of your mind is uh, we have a viewer who is just really reinforcing what you're saying, but wonders, will you address, is there a correlation and or a real way out of this cycle of poverty and people being seen with this disease and they're bad and so it reinforces the cycle? Right, right. And, and we can talk a little bit about that, but um, that might also be a topic for one of the, the, the next webinars as well. So just let's keep that uh, in the back of our heads. So Kate, if you just go to the next slide, uh, but if you want to talk about kind of quality of life and other kinds of, um, you know, the experience of life, one of the things to, uh, to also keep in mind is that 
the life expectancy by race and gender is um, highly variable, but what's important is that it's much lower for blacks than it is for whites. So starting in the 1970s, the difference in life expectancy for black males compared to white uh, males was, uh, you know, is about a little over um, uh, eight or nine years. And right now it's about the same. And for, uh, you know, black females or white females, there's about the same gap. And then there's a gigantic gap between black males and white females in terms of, uh, of life expectancy. But the question uh, for us is, you know, what describes or what, what, what accounts for this difference in, in life expectancy and wealth and other things? And part of it, I, my argument today is going to be that it's uh, a lot of it is explained in land policy. All right, so um, act one, let's just talk about land policy and how it got its origins in the Great Depression. So if you don't know about the Great Depression, in the Great Depression, we had bank failure, widespread unemployment, and the collapse of housing markets that put the entire country at risk. And the New Deal, which was kind of conceived as a way to kind of save the country from the depths of the Great Decession, they realized that heroic things had to be done to rescue both the economy and the political system from the joint threats of fascism and socialism. And as you know, fascism was on the rise in places like Germany and Italy uh, and Japan. Uh, and socialism was on the rise in places like uh, Russia, right? And all the satellite states where uh, socialism really started to take hold. But in their efforts to kind of deal with the collapse of the national economy, the New Dealers made many, many compromises, some that were made in deference to the urgency of the moment, and some that were made for political expediency. And we're still paying for a lot of those compromises that, uh, today. So for example, the Homeowner Loan Corporation was created uh, in 1933 to refinance mortgages for people who were going to lose their houses through foreclosure. And basically what they did was they created um, a bond financed uh, program that went and interviewed uh, homeowners and offered them uh, refinances, refinancing their existing mortgage into a 25 year uh, self amortizing mortgage, which was an invention of that time because we didn't finance houses uh, that way before 1933. So it pioneered that the modern self amortizing mortgage um, and it really, it refinanced about $3 billion of mortgages for more than a million families, which is equivalent to about $1 trillion uh, today as a share of GDP. So then uh, the National Housing Act also created the Federal Housing Administration that was used to ensure new mortgages and make homeownership opportunities more widely available. Because before the Great Depression, the way families bought a house was to put 50% down and they got a five year interest only loan that had a balloon payment at the end that said after five years, you had to pay the other half of the value of your house to buy the home. But most people didn't have the money to buy their home at the end of their five year period. So they'd have to refinance and roll it over. But when the banks collapsed, the banks didn't have any money to lend to people to refinance their loans. So they called all the loans, which is why millions of people were facing foreclosure. But by the 1940s, millions of families had purchased or retained homes using the two programs and home ownership became stable shelter and it built wealth for all those families who are able to do that. So out of the ashes of the Great Depression, the great American middle class was born. But unfortunately, that middle class didn't offer those opportunities for all families. So the deficit hawks, nativists and racists in Congress, and they really were racists in Congress. If you read the proceedings, some of them are embarrassing with how, they're, how blatantly racist they are. They oppose programs that risk increasing the federal debt uh, by offering handouts to immigrants or people of color. And the deficit hawks also said that public lending must minimize the financial risk to the national government. So they, they insisted that mortgages could only be extended to those with the best prospects of repaying the loans um, or having collateral that would maintain its value. So if the loan went bad, they would be able to recover the value of the debt through uh, repossession of the house. And the racists made sure that that program implementation was done unequally. So what does that mean? Well, the agents of the Homeowner Loan Corporation traveled around the country and they met with local bankers and realtors to determine where and to whom home refinancing would be offered. 
And at the time, many state and local governments already actively promoted racial discrimination by saying where people of different races could live with racial steering and you know, overt segregation, especially in the US South, right? So the Homeowner Loan Corporation created secret color-coded maps of the nation's cities that were discovered in the 1970s by a historian named Kenneth Jackson that guided the lending decisions of the Homeowner Loan Corporation. And those maps had really four colors with red indicating hazardous neighborhoods where lending was discouraged, green and blue indicating the best neighborhoods where you could uh, lend, and yellow for cautionary neighborhoods that might be um, at risk of flipping um, race or ethnicity, right? And what, they, what happened was neighborhoods with high proportions of people of color or people of Eastern or Southern European descent or Jews were always shaded red, regardless of the quality of the homes or the nature of the local economy. So Kate, if you can go to the next uh, slide. So this is one of the homeowner loan corporation maps for Miami. And as you can see, uh, there's green and blue and yellow and red uh, neighborhoods. But if you know Miami, you'll see that there's this cluster of red neighborhoods kind of right in the middle of the map that, that go right um, down towards the, um, uh, the Biscayne Bay. And that's a neighborhood called Overton and some other adjacent neighborhoods there, which was a thriving middle-class black neighborhood, which is, and also an entertainment center um, that was um, doing quite well. But it was, um, it was almost 100% black and the, the Homeowner Loan Corporation with the help of local realtors and bankers decided that was a hazardous place to lend. And so very few um, mortgage refinances were offered in, the, in that neighborhood. That's okay if you can go to the next slide. So Mac, while, while you're talking about this, a question came up earlier in, in the studies that you've done at the Lincoln Institute. Did the, did the st statistics that you're using, um, are they equitable in rural, suburban and urban areas or are there disparities there? Oh, the, the disparities are huge everywhere. So they're, they're, there's disparities within any urban area. There's disparities across metropolitan regions and there's huge disparities between rural and urban places and within rural areas as well. So no, the disparities run you know, really right across all geographies and they're usually experienced in the same way by um, you know, underprivileged groups, uh, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, and sometimes religious minorities, right? Right, and that plays out with home ownership and wealth as well, correct? It plays out with home ownership, wealth, and as you'll uh, soon learn, uh, life expectancy. So um, the, um, this is a map of New Orleans, and if you know New Orleans, you, you'll see that that area on the kind of uh, north of the Mississippi River towards the east is a place called like the Lower Ninth Ward uh, and the Upper Ninth Ward, um, Treme, um, and these were, once again, thriving middle-class Black neighborhoods that the Homeowner Loan Corporation decided that they weren't going to make uh, loans in. Um, and Kate, if you want to go to the next slide. And for those of you who are joining us from uh, LA, this is a map of your city. And in your city, once again, you can see the, um, the outline of the different neighborhoods that are going to be considered for um, mortgage refinances. The green and the blue are place, places like, oh, Beverly Hills. Um, and the red, East of LA, Boyle Heights, Watts, um, and even oddly enough, parts of Venice and Santa Monica uh, were, um, were mostly, in this case, Latino, and um, some of them were African-American, but, um, and, uh, and some of them had other kinds of ethnic enclaves, but none of them were targets for lending by the Homeowner Loan Corporation. Uh, Kate, if you wanna to go to the next slide. And this is um, just to understand kind of how people were unashamed at using you know, seemingly uh, a blatant racist kinds of, uh, of, of um, terminology. This is a map of uh, St. Paul, Minnesota that was generated in 1935 by um, the local realtors and, the, uh, and planners. And you can see how they just you know, labeled neighborhoods. Like one neighborhood says uh, slum and underneath it, it says Italian, Jews, and Negroes, right? And then there's this other neighborhood that runs uh, of east to west uh, that just says Negroes, right? And then there's apartment houses and Gold Coast and slum and central business district. 
Um, and uh, basically, it was um, it was a way for people to just understand how the the different neighborhoods are organized ethnically and racially in in St. Paul, not with any intent to do anything about it, just so people knew where they were, right? So, um, uh, Kate, if you go uh, to the next slide, oh, oh no, all right, yeah, we'll we'll stop on this one. This is a homeowner loan corporation map that was done for that that same area, but St. Paul is you know um, above the the um, the, the, the Mississippi River in this map. And that area that, that's labeled D4 is that, that narrow neighborhood that, is, um, that was labeled Negroes in uh, the, the, the local map. And it's uh, a neighborhood that's uh, actually uh, quite well known, especially in Minneapolis, St. Paul, but sometimes in the rest of the country, because it's called Rondo. And Rondo was once again, a thriving middle-class and really mixed uh, race uh, neighborhood that was home to people like August Wilson, the famous playwright. It was, um, uh, it was the, uh, basically it was considered to be the Harlem of the West or the Midwest. And it was a destination for, um, for uh, talented folks, artists, uh, musicians, and, um, and it had many, many thriving uh, businesses there. So, you know, the national policy that, that kind of dictated who was gonna get lent, uh, lent to was, really um, kind of constructed based on kind of, you know, blatant kind of racial uh, constraints. So for example, the code of ethics for the National Association of Real Estate Board said, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing members of any race or nationality whose presence will clearly be detrimental to property values in the neighborhood. And then uh, Kenneth Jackson mentioned uh, when he analyzed the work of the Homeowner Loan Corporation and the FHA, he said they devised a rating system that undervalued neighborhoods that were dense, mixed, or aging, and applied existing notions of ethnic and racial worth to real estate appraising on an unprecedented scale. But basically what this means is they just said that if you live in a neighborhood that has a large percentage of ethnic or racial or, um, or religious minorities, you could expect that for a very similar house to another neighborhood, it would be devalued because of the character of the people that lived in the neighborhood. But what it also meant was that lenders would look at lending there as risky because the value of the collateral was low and could get lower uh, and, the, and the, the risk to repaying the loan uh, was, uh, or non-repaying the loan was higher. So, so, um, so Matt, ahead, a, gen a general question um, that's come up a couple times is, so is this what folks are, call, are calling redlining? So this is, yeah, this is called redlining. Uh, it would, it, it's actually not exactly uh, how the redlining term uh, got defined because in the redlining term, basically what, they, what the, uh, the, it characterized it as something the bankers did when they went to a map and they put a red line around certain neighborhoods and said, we're not lending there. <laughs> and that's, and so, and the, the red line in the map is basically like the, the, the red, the characterization of these neighborhoods, but it is, this is the process that we now know as redlining, yes. And it got its origins in the Great Depression. But it's also one of the reasons why we see whites with home ownership rates that are in many cases over 70 or 75%, and, and, and blacks and Hispanics and other minorities with home ownership rates in the 40% range. So Mac, while you're considering this, we have, there's a, a lot of good conversation going on in the Q&A with some wonderful statements. And we have a person who's it, wondering whether you've done similar studies um, or the Lincoln Institute has delved into Detroit and Ferndale and this idea of the wall that really built homeownership in the white area of Ferndale against all the others. So that's a, that's a great question. And, and that's something that I hope that people who uh, take this webinar and the, the other uh, two webinars and think about studying with us at CLU will find is that we'll give you the tools to tell that story. So I'm not gonna tell you that story today, but I'll say that yes, we'll, you can have the tools that will be able to tell that story and other similar stories in every other place in the country. And, and by the way, then the question came up, where, where, where did you get this? Where, where are these maps from? And what, what is this tool? So, so as it turns out, the, so the tool you'll hear more about in the next webinar, it's called a story map. But where I got these maps, these maps are all digitized after they were 
discovered by um, Kenneth Jackson, but the University of Richmond, the Richmond Federal Reserve Bank, um, and some academics uh, created a site that you can actually, you can see all the maps and they have maps for cities all over the country that were created by the Homeowner Loan Corporation. And you can download them in various different forms. So this, this, it's all available online, right? Okay, so that's the Great Depression. But the point of the Great Depression is we laid the groundwork for saying, all right, well, you know, we're going to make all these efforts to make sure that the country doesn't fall into despair or the depression doesn't worsen by investing in things like home ownership and wealth building and the middle class. But we're only going to give access to the middle class basically to white people. And also not just white people, but mostly white people from Northern Europe because Italians and Eastern Europeans uh, and Greeks were just very often excluded from the same markets, at least for the middle part of the 20th century. But the rest of the 20th century um, just kind of exacerbated those problems because other kind of national policy decisions just made things worse, right? So this cascading set of decisions included things like the underwriting standards that were created, that were created after World War II for VA mortgages, which also excluded minorities. So minorities who went and served their country, many of whom died for their country, came back, weren't given the same benefits if they were black or if they were ethnic minorities than if they were white. But even worse, and this is something that's really relevant today, major infrastructure decisions uh, were taken that also continued to disadvantage the disadvantaged. And part of that was the construction of the interstate highway system, but it was also the, uh, a, a process called urban renewal and the construction of affordable housing. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, both of those. Um, and then of course, in the rest of the 20th century, other decisions were made to ameliorate these things because it started to become apparent. And by the 1950s, we realized that the level of inequality we generated in just about 25 years was already unacceptable. And starting with um, Brown versus Board of Education and the desegregation of schools, we decided we had to become actually, we had to live up to our own standards of fairness, basically is what it was. But I wanna just take a kind of a deeper dive into Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I do it because that was the trigger point for all kind of the Black Lives Matter, all the kind of new um, um, uh, social unrest that were all generated by the murder of George Floyd. Now, I realize that Black Lives Matter predates the murder of George Floyd because we had any number of other unarmed uh, black men uh, you know, killed at the, at the hands of the police. But um, this was one of those things that was so egregious people couldn't turn away and figure out um, anything else to do but to begin to say, this is unacceptable, we need to find ways to address it. But the, um, the interstate highway system as an infrastructure project was the largest infrastructure project in the world ever, like bigger than the pyramids, right? It, and it, it, was a, it was a project, it was the project that really was responsible for carving paths through our cities and dividing and destroying thriving, uh, uh, low income and, uh, uh, and minorities characterized by racial minorities, right? And so, uh, and so the, the highways cleave two of the oldest black neighborhoods in the country. I mentioned Treme in New Orleans and Overtown in Miami. In Overtown, 10,000 homes predominantly owned by people of color were taken and demolished. And in Treme, planners and activists who are now advocating for the demolition of the section of I-10 that they put in, with a goal, they have a goal of restoring Claiborne Avenue, which was a thriving middle-class black commercial corridor that was completely destroyed when they put I-10 above it um, in, in the construction um, of, um, of uh, that, that, that interstate highway. But once again, if we just superimpose the interstate highways over the, the maps of the um, of uh, the Homeowner Loan Corporation. And, and Kate, if you can go to the next slide, you can see what I mean. Because you see that in Miami, for example, uh, the interstate highways run right through the red neighborhoods. And uh, if you had more of them, you'd see that there's even, there's, there's another set of interstate highways that go through that big red neighborhood that's, that's to the west of I-95. But uh, the interchange and the, uh, between uh, 395 and I-95 it's right um, in Overton and it, uh, it, it, it uh, displays some 3,000 uh, families, right? And if you go to the next slide, 
So this is New Orleans. And look at uh, New Orleans. They routed I-10, uh, the 110, Route 90, um, right through the, these red neighborhoods uh, that were characterized, of course, by ethnic minorities. And they weren't, even the, they weren't even the most efficient way to get people across New Orleans. But it was, it was almost intentional to say, we're gonna drive these, uh, these highways right through these low-income neighborhoods because um, we can do it. And when you talk to the, the planners who, who plan the highways, they would say things like, well, if you're gonna build a highway, where else would you build it but where land is cheap? But they acted as if land was cheap because of some other you know, God-given uh, uh, attribute of that land. Not that land was cheap because we refused to lend there and housing prices fell, right? So now if you look at LA, uh, the next slide, um, okay. You can see where does uh, where do some of the major highways through LA go? Right through uh, East LA and um, that big interchange in East LA is uh, um, uh, responsible for displacing 3,000 homes. And if you look at the Santa Monica freeway um, to the left of the 110 sign, that went through a neighborhood uh, that no longer exists. Um, that was a middle-class black neighborhood. And the reason they routed it there is because they didn't want to disturb Frat Row for USC. So, um, uh, and it was, you know, it was once again, blatant. You could have you could imagine a way to get to Santa Monica that wouldn't have put you through that red neighborhood, but what, what would you have to go through? The blue neighborhood. And why would you want to do that? when you could um, displace, uh, you know, unempowered, low-income minority residents. So, Mac, we have a, 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 an audience member who has said, have you seen any improvements in the dissemination of land use? Um, and how does it impact the immigrant community? So, as it turns out, one of the things that's being talked about now all over the country, especially in preparation for this big infrastructure bill that's coming out, is um, using a new tool that, that, um, that is uh, kind of an important tool, for, not just for infrastructure decisions, but for lots of things called um, uh, you know, an equity review. And so they actually review the decisions about where they, they, um, they do things, where they, where they place things based on whether or not they have inequitable impact on uh, other organizations that are identifiable by class, race, ethnicity. So now every uh, infrastructure decision that's going to be made is going to be subjected to additional scrutiny based on whether or not it's exacerbating inequality, right? So these uh, equity analyses are now a set of tools that are being adopted by federal agencies to do the right thing, right? And so, you know, and, and whether doing the right thing means going through, uh, putting your superhighway through Beverly Hills remains to be seen, but at least we're gonna find a way to get the community at the table and think through more creative ways to do our infrastructure investments that don't always disadvantage the people who've historically been disadvantaged. Yeah, so, so Mac, with about 25 minutes left, we have a couple of folks, we have several of our MPA students on, on the line. And mm -hmm. there, could you, could you make the connection between banking laws, local zoning and land use decisions um, and the inequities there. All right, so, well, I'll just make it, I, I just make a quick connection. So local zoning will define what kind of buildings can be built. And sometimes what kind of buildings that can be built are as simple as whether you can build multifamily uh, housing or if it's zoned specifically for single family housing. And that kind of zoning will define in many ways how expensive it's gonna be for someone to live there. So whether it's done directly or indirectly, you can actually sort people, at least according to income, by how you zone and you can exclude people you want to exclude by having minimum lot sizes and only allowing single family development in that, uh, in that area. And now um, all the cities and there's hundreds and hundreds of places in the country that are starting to examine their zoning to see the extent to which their zoning itself created racial exclusion by saying, we're gonna raise the bar what it's gonna to cost to develop and we're going to keep undesirable people out by just zoning out multifamily developments, small houses, and we're going to make people build on, you know, half acre lots, uh, in a minimum size home, right? 
lenders will, will lend based on their expectation of what the risk is. And basically lenders use the, you know, the three C's to make their decisions. Character of the borrower, uh, credit quality of the borrower, and the collateral value. But as you can see, the zoning already kind of dictates the collateral value. So you know where lenders are going to go. And then the and then character of the borrower is sometimes a loose way of saying we want to lend to people who are like us that we understand, right? And then credit is offered to people who have had success at getting credit in the past. But if you only lend to people who are like you, the people who aren't like you who don't get uh, loans aren't going to have credit. And so it's like a it's a little bit of a complex machine, but the complex machine will definitely generate inequitable outcomes by the interaction of, of the forces of, of how lenders work, how zoning works, and how housing development actually takes place, right? So um, I just want to take a, a, a little bit deeper dive in on the interstate highway thing in, in Minneapolis-St. Paul, because Minneapolis-St. Paul is kind of an interesting place. And if you look at Minneapolis-St. Paul, in Minneapolis, you know, looking at once again at the, the different kinds of homeowner loan uh, corporation areas, the, the amount of freeway that, uh, that an area took compared to the land area of, of that type of neighborhood is a really telling story. So in the best neighborhoods, the select neighborhoods, the neighborhoods that are, uh, that are green and blue, the land area of the neighborhood is, is much higher than the amount of freeway that the neighborhood took. But look at the red neighborhoods, the hazardous neighborhoods. In Minneapolis, St. Paul, hazardous neighborhoods represented 16.8% of the land area, but they took 47.5% of the highways. And if you go to the next slide, Kate, it's even worse in St. Paul, where 28% of the land area took 56.4% of the highways and the best areas which accounted for 13.9% of the land area took less than 1%, took 0.2% of the highways. Now this is really kind of, this is an important um, fact because, and this isn't just Minneapolis, St. Paul, almost any major city you go to, it tells the same story. And it all it tells you is that the logic that is generated from the land policy decisions and the lending decisions that were made and our efforts to build our way out of the Great uh, Depression created, there were systemic creation of inequality that kept being reinforced again and again and again, in this case, by the highway system. Um, and then, um, Kate, if you go to the next slide, back to the 1935, you know, realtors map of uh, St. Paul, you'll see that I-94, when it roars through St. Paul, went right through Rondo. When I told you the Harlem of the Midwest, right? And um, if you look at that green line above it, the, the, the neighborhood organized and tried to get the, the, the Federal Highway Administration to think differently about where to put the highway. And right now, that's where the light rail goes. But in 1935, it was an abandoned rail corridor. And so rather than put the highway uh, a mile away on, in this abandoned rail corridor, they decided to run it right through the heart of Rondo, the middle-class African-American uh, district. And that's kind of the, the tragedy, and that's just kind of the story of what I'm calling land policy played out in multiple acts that, that lead to uh, it, you know, inequitable outcomes down the line. So Kate, if you go to the next slide, and if you wonder what a highway going through a city looks like, this is I-94 going through Rondo. And so Rondo is actually right on both sides of this. In fact, Rondo Ave is on one side or the other of this uh, freeway. But um, for people that lived in Rondo, you can imagine if you're a kid and your school is on one side of this highway or your church is on one side of this highway and your house is on the other, you should be able to walk a few blocks over there now you're gonna walk up to the overpass that'll allow you to get across and back down. And look at how scarring this, this, uh, this highway is through that neighborhood. It wiped out blocks and blocks of people. And, and it, they destroyed 300 businesses. It destroyed um, uh, thousands of homes. And, um, and it, it, was, it was justified because for the planners, they said what they're really doing was clearing slums. 
And for them, slums was actually code for places where blacks lived, not for places where the housing was necessarily deficient, right? So in, in Minneapolis alone, 29% of those displaced by urban renewal between 1950 and 1966 were families of color, even though they represented 3% of the city's population. 29% of the displaced came from 3% of the city's population. And just for, to give you an example of another place, in Glynn County, Georgia, where Ahmaud Arbery was killed while jogging, 93% of the households displaced by urban renewal were families of color, although they made up only one third of the population of that county. So that's just, it tells you, you know, volumes, even though, you know, we haven't necessarily kind of owned it yet, uh, although we're starting to own it now. So, but it's not just the highways, it's not just kind of, you know, slum clearance, urban renewal, it's also where we choose now to build subsidized housing. Because as, as one of the questioners pointed out, zoning has a, you know, a lot to do with what you can build and where you can build it. And one of the things that a lot of people do not want in their neighborhoods is subsidized housing. So yeah, starting during the Great Depression, we built 2 million units of public housing and we used it as a way to uh, clear slums because every unit of housing, of public housing we built, we use it to demolish um, a, a slum house. And once again, as, as noted, urban renewal was used to uh, clear the areas that we built public housing and urban renewal cleared a very disproportionate share of low income and minority residents in order to do that. So but, Matt, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. All right, but so now just once again, if you look now at our most recent, uh, you know, uh, subsidized housing program in the United States, the low income housing tax credit, and once again, you look in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and if you look at the next map, Kate, every one of these orange dots is a low income housing tax credit unit. And those neighborhoods that are, that are, um, uh, that are shaded a dark uh, green are uh, shaded, the darker the green, the higher the concentration of African-Americans in those census tracts are. And if you look, there's not very many orange dots in the light green areas. And then you look at the dark green areas and the orange dots are prominent. And if you look over to the right of your map and you see old Rondo Ave and you see that it's surrounded by orange dots. So um, where did we decide to put low-income people using the low-income housing tax credits? In the places where low-income people already were, we call that the concentration of poverty. And if you just go to the next map, Kate, I zoom in on Minneapolis and you just see where all of those low-income housing units are, they're in the, the black African-American neighborhoods. And if you look at the next map, that's Rondo, and th it's the same story. So Lynn, did you have a, a question? A couple, yeah, a couple questions. Are there any cities leading the change in re-examining zoning, okay? Any specific examples? And, and do city councils ever look at these maps? Are, there, are, are they regularly using the tools? I mean, what, we, we seem to still be in the first act as well. We're still post-depression or have we gotten to the second and third no, act? No, we're in the second act. We're in the rest of the 20th century, which is the okay. second act. And we're moving very quickly into the 21st century. But the answer is yes. And what's really kind of interesting is one of the places that's been most aggressive at uh, zoning reform is Minneapolis, St. Paul. And starting a couple of years ago, they banned single family zoning in the entire city of Minneapolis. So now they can't mandate that, that uh, the, the, the zoning board or the planners can't say, if you wanna build in this neighborhood, you have to build a detached single family dwelling. They can't tell you that anymore. And they used to in the past. They can't set minimum lot uh, sizes and tell you to build one unit of housing on that lot. And so everybody's up in arms because they're saying, oh my God, it's Armageddon, anything goes. People are gonna be putting you know, 10 story buildings next to single family homes and, and maybe they will. But the, uh, the point is that they're finally starting to come to grips with the implications of what was done over time. And, you know, we haven't necessarily gotten it completely correct, but let's say we're, we're getting it better, right? Okay, a couple right. Of one quick follow up. Does, how does land value tax add to equity or will it? Um, that's a very long answer okay. to a very difficult right. question, but let's just say, that there was a concern that land value tax would actually um, increase 
it's things like gentrification and equity, but uh, in all the studies we've looked at, there's no evidence at all that, that uh, land value capture, land taxes actually harm uh, low income people at all, right? So, um, and that's something that you could, uh, we, you can explore further even by looking on our website at the Lincoln Institute. But so, so here's one of the things that, that we also need to grapple with, because if we say that we find all the stories I'm telling about, uh, you know, inequality and how it's, you know, organized spatially, um, it wasn't as if this is unknown in, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And in fact, for over 50 years, we tried to remedy it with, with federal policy. So starting in 1956 with uh, you know, Brown versus Board, we, we mandated that schools get desegregated. It didn't happen overnight, but it, it did start in 1956. In 1964, we, we passed a Civil Rights Act that banned all, for, all forms of discrimination and, and also gave yeah, equal rights at the poll and other things to all uh, races and, and classes. In 1968, we passed the Fair Housing Act, which also included fair lending, which banned any kind of discrimination in, in um, housing choice or housing lending. And in 1976, we passed the Community Reinvestment Act, which included uh, an obligation, of, of, uh, an affirmative obligation for, for regulated lenders to actually lend two communities that they'd excluded in the past, right? And this was, this was accompanied by dozens of precedent setting court decisions and presidential executive orders. And yet, you know, the enduring impact of what happened and started in the Great Depression was barely touched by all of those national efforts. So today in the former Rondo area that we're talking about, you're looking at the map now, just north of I-94, the population is 57% black and the average income is about $55,000. Less than a mile south in the Grand Avenue neighborhood, which if you remember the map I showed you before, they had a map that said Gold Coast, that's the Grand Avenue neighborhood. Um, the, uh, the population is 81% white and the median income is $119,000, which is more than double the income of Rondo. But what's more striking about it is Grand Avenue, which was ranked by Forbes magazine, one of the 10 prettiest neighborhoods in America. Life expectancy is 84 years, uh, 84 years, which is 10 years longer than in the Rondo neighborhood where life expectancy is 74 years. So if you go one mile in St. Paul from, the, from Grand Avenue to Rondo, somehow um, we'll have to explain why that's 10 years of life expectancy difference for the residents. And that's male and female, right? Um, so anyway, so the, the, this complex relationship between neighborhood, race, wealth, health, you know, that's a subject for, you know, dissertations, right? But, you know, if we start to kind of at least unpack it, we also understand that neighborhoods offer vastly different access to schools, healthcare, career ladders, you know, social connections and, and much more. And the effects of redlining, you know, can show up in unexpected ways. So, so for example, just recently, you know, with uh, the climate crisis, people started to look at things like um, heat island effects in cities. And in research, uh, recent research, there's, I think this was done a, a year ago now, um, they showed that in Minneapolis, St. Paul, one of the highest heat dispar disparities uh, are between the red neighborhoods on the homeowner loan corporation map and the, uh, the, 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 the green neighborhoods. And the difference is 11 degrees average temperature on a hot day. But nationally, the researchers found that on average, neighborhoods once shaded in red and homeowner loan corporation maps are 4.7 degrees warmer than neighborhoods uh, shaded in green. So how is it possible that if you live in a neighborhood that was that some uh, banker and some you know, uh, um, realtors designated as red or green or blue, you now experience higher levels of, uh, of, of temperature on, uh, you know, on hot days. And of course, if you don't know it, and I, you, we've heard a lot about it uh, this year, at least because of, of the weather, um, heat related deaths are the number one killer of weather related deaths in, in the United States and, and possibly the world. And certainly in Canada this year, where they had an incredible number of heat-related deaths, and they kill 
multiple times the number of people were hurricanes or tornadoes killed. And it's kind of silent because it, it, it happens, but people kind of attribute those deaths to lots of different things. But then, you know, something that they didn't know anything about in 1933 when they created the MAPS COVID, Mortality rates from COVID indicate that Black Americans are 2.4 times more likely to, to, to die from the disease than white Americans. Now, a lot of the pundits, when they started to interview them, and I'm sure you've all seen them on TV, they explained it away by citing underlying health conditions or lack of access to health care. But before COVID, the life expectancy between hazardous homeowner loan corporation neighborhoods and more affluent white neighborhoods varied by as much as 20 years. And now with COVID, it's even gotten worse. And so the, 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 the explanation, one of the other explanations is that higher long-term exposure to pollution increases the chance of death from COVID by 8%. And high pollution rates in the United States are linked more to race than to poverty. So Kate, if you show the next uh, map. So this is a map of brownfields in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Every one of those orange dots is a designated brownfield where somebody left some toxic chemical behind. Um, and if you look, um, this is basically this, uh, this dark shaded area where Route 94 goes through is Rwanda. And look at Rwanda, it's surrounded by brownfields. So if you want to understand why is it that, you know, mortality uh, to COVID is more pronounced for African Americans, there's like seven explanations, but one of them is because they're exposed to pollution. And by the way, an interstate highway also runs right through the middle of that neighborhood, which probably explains why the life expectancy is 10 years shorter than for people who live a mile south of there because they don't have to live with all of the negative impacts of having a highway run right through the middle of their neighborhood. So Lynn, do you have another question? I, I do. I want to let, alert you, you only have, we only have about three minutes. We have very passionate people in the Q and A, and that's that's fabulous. It's good to know there's so many people who really have may come from different parts of the country, different language, but the passion is definitely there. But there is a stream of questions that that say, so what do we do about it? It sounds like, and I'm going to put this in different language. It sounds like we've got a problem because change is going to require um, the preferred folks to give up something some freedoms in order to address the real issues? I don't know. I wouldn't say it's necessarily giving up freedoms, but it's having, it, it, it's requiring the, the, um, the privilege to be able to give up privilege. Better said, better said. That's right? and, so, and the thing is, it, and, and it's still true that people aren't gonna voluntarily give up privilege unless you find um, other ways to get them to understand it. But I'd say that, that uh, the construction of privilege itself is something you have to examine because um, you might be deprivileging yourself and the rest of your family by not exposing them to the richness of the world if they're only exposed to people who are like them and wealthy like them and privileged like them. But you only understand that once people have been able to uh, erode the differences and understand the value of knowing people um, of diverse backgrounds, diverse um, uh, a race, diverse um, religion. Um, and um, I think that it's just something that, it, 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 of course it's not gonna happen overnight, but it's something we have to confront. And if you think about you know, confronting those kinds of things in, in our own recent history, we've confronted that in places like South Africa where things like restorative justice was invented with truth commissions and everything else. And it starts with kind of understanding that our history and our privilege is, is sometimes based on um, immoral things that we're willing to do to kind of, kind of construct that privilege. And the first thing we have to do is own it and tell the this, this story. And the second thing we have to do is um, atone for it. And so um, it's, it, it's not an easy conversation to have and that's why social change is never easy. But one of the things that, that, that um, I've noted in my own life and certainly with all the, the folks that, that I've worked with or have worked for me, is that there is um, far more interest and tolerance in, um, in, in others um, now than there, were, than there was even 20 or 30 years ago. And the possibilities, especially when you look at our kids and the idea that uh, kids are becoming more and more kind of colorblind 
and hopefully they'll become more and more class blind over time. They will begin to embrace kind of the benefits of knowing people of all you know, walks of life. Because a lot of us actually grew up in, in mixed income neighborhoods and, and came out of it unscarred, oddly enough, right? So I, I will wrap it up quickly, but I do want to talk about one other big thing because in our own lifetime, and this was only 10 years ago, the Great Recession um, happened. And you know the colossal failure of the banks of the world, driven mostly by racist practices in the lending industry, you know, predatory lending, that, then, that, that created a housing bubble that took down the world economy. The federal, uh, the federal government saved the global financial system by pumping trillions of dollars into investment banks, insurance companies, and other public companies but stood by idly as the wealth of minorities evaporated. And if you look, according to Pew, from 2005 to 2009, the median wealth fell by 66% among Hispanic households and by 53% among black households, while it only fell 16% among white households. And home ownership rates fell even further for minorities uh, as, a, as a percentage. And so this is still experienced now because this is from uh, 2018, if you look at the home ownership gap in different places, not just the national one, the worst home ownership gap in the country is in Minneapolis, St. Paul. <laughs> Maybe that's why they decided to ban single family zoning. 76% of white households own their home, but only 25% of black households do. That's a, a, a triple the, the home ownership rate in the white community as, as it is in the black community. And in Milwaukee, the difference is 42%, Rochester. The point is that these things still live with us. And even when we have an opportunity to do the right thing, like address the Great Recession, we kind of redid what we did in the Great Depression by allowing kind of um, the disadvantaged people to bear the burden of, uh, of our response. And we didn't let AIG go down the tubes, but we certainly were willing to let um, you know, all minority families who lost millions of them, who lost home ownership through foreclosures, um, and we did very little to kind of uh, save them. So, all right, so let's just, I'll just try to wrap it up real quickly and we can, if we have time, we can have even some other questions, but so how we account for racial inequities, uh, poverty and inequality really matters. And if we tell a story that, that, that tries to blame it on the victim, we're doing ourselves and the victims a real disservice. But if we understand that it's built into the system, then we can start to work on it by fixing the system, right? And so if we get away from this idea of a culture of poverty and blaming the victim and move towards systemic responses to systemic inequality, we'll go a lot further. But, you know, and even efforts that we took over the last 50 years to address the rig system weren't really sufficient because almost every one of those, the Community Reinvestment Act, the Equal, uh, the, the Fair Housing Act, um, the the uh, Civil Rights Act, they were all efforts to balance the scales, right? To, to level the playing field. But if you level the playing field in an inequitable uh, system, you don't actually redress the inequality. You just, you just freeze it in place. And sometimes you just kind of um, continue it because you say, well, if we just make sure that everybody has the same chances now, but everybody has the same chances when you come from a family or from a group that has 76% home ownership rates versus a group that has 25% home ownership rates, hitting a level playing field at that point isn't gonna change that ratio unless you take an affirmative action to make a difference. So why am I talking about this now? Because we're pumping trillions of dollars again into the economy as a result of COVID and as a result of all of our attempts to deal with all of the challenges associated with, um, uh, with um, the, the, the disruption of supply chains, the collapse of, of the service economy, all that. But it isn't clear yet that we've been able to kind of embed the message that we need to find ways to make our recovery more equitable. And so we need to make sure that we commit ourselves to policies, both at the local level and the national level, that build in kind of remedial measures that actually benefit uh, the underprivileged and don't benefit the privileged. And we haven't really done that very well in this country because the privileged tend to be very powerful and are able to advocate for things on their own behalf. And the underprivileged just are you know, very often stuck 
you know, taking what they get. So we can't settle for narrow responses to current events and forget that the roots of unacceptable disparate life circumstances are deeply embedded in all of our policies and particularly our land policies. And we, can, we can't make the same mistakes we made in the 1930s that allow kind of the urgency of the moment to give cover to policies that we say, we don't have time to really get it right. So we're just gonna run out the door and throw money out, but make sure and, and not make sure the money lands in the right laps. And we can't take the same actions we took in the great recession where we prioritize the wealth and the survival of corporations over communities. So um, I look forward to the discussion and, and we'll talk a little bit about what we can do next um, and, and what we're gonna do next in terms of this, uh, this series because we're now gonna try to equip you with some tools that will help you to begin to address uh, this problem. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And Lynn, am I turning it back to you or am I gonna- You're turning it back to me. And I think we got most of the questions answered. We were typing madly back away. We've saved others. All of you, yes, the recording will be available. Yes, you'll receive links to it. You'll receive an email follow-up on the next two webinars. Um, the next one goes detail into those maps that you were seeing and the third really begins to address, so what do we do now? And then you will receive a second follow-up email with links to resources. Again, thank you so much on behalf of Claremont Lincoln University and the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. We look forward to seeing you in a few weeks, October 13th, October 27th. Watch your email. You'll be sure to get an invitation. And have a great day. Go out and make a difference. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>